The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter Five. The Pinch Bug and His Prey. About half past ten, the cracked bell of the small church began to ring, and presently the people began to gather for the morning sermon. The Sunday school children distributed themselves about the house and occupied pews with their parents, so as to be under supervision. Aunt Polly came, and Tom and Sid and Mary sat with her. Tom being placed next to the aisle in order that he might be as far away from the open window and the seductive outside summer scenes as possible. The crowd filed up the aisles, the aged and needy postmaster, who had seen better days, the mayor and his wife, for they had a mayor there, among other unnecessaries, the justice of the peace, the widow Douglas, fair, smart, and forty, a generous, good-hearted soul, and well-to-do, her hill mansion the only palace in the town, and the most hospitable and much the most lavish in the matter of festivities that St. Petersburg could boast, the bent and venerable Major and Mrs. Ward, Lawyer Riverson, the new notable from a distance, next the belle of the village, followed by a troop of lawn-clad and ribbon-decked young heartbreakers, then all the young clerks in town in a body, for they had stood in the vestibule sucking their cane-heads, a circling wall of oiled and simpering admirers, till the last girl had run their gauntlet. And last of all came the model-boy, Willie Mufferson, taking as heedful care of his mother as if she were cut glass. He always brought his mother to church, and was the pride of all the matrons. The boys all hated him. He was no good. And besides, he had been thrown up to them so much. His white handkerchief was hanging out of his pocket behind, as usual on Sundays, accidentally. Tom had no handkerchief, and he looked upon boys who had, as snobs. The congregation being fully assembled now, the bell rang once more, to warn laggards and stragglers, and then a solemn hush fell upon the church, which was only broken by the tittering and whispering of the choir in the gallery. The choir always tittered and whispered all through service. There was once a church choir that was not ill-bred, but I have forgotten where it was now. It was a great many years ago, and I can scarcely remember anything about it, but I think it was in some foreign country. The minister gave out the hymn, and read it through with a relish in a peculiar style which was much admired in that part of the country. His voice began on a medium key, and climbed steadily up till it reached a certain point, where it bore with strong emphasis upon the topmost word, and then plunged down as if from a springboard. Shall I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, whilst others fight to win the prize, and sail through bloody seas? He was regarded as a wonderful reader. At church, sociables, he was always called upon to read poetry, and when he was through, the ladies would lift up their hands and let them fall helplessly in their laps, and wow their eyes, and shake their heads, as much as to say, words cannot express it. It is too beautiful, too beautiful for this mortal earth. After the hymn had been sung, the Reverend Mr. Sprague turned himself into a bulletin-board, and read off notices of meetings and societies and things, till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom, a queer custom which is still kept up in America, even in cities away here in this age of abundant newspapers. Often the less there is to justify a traditional custom, the harder it is to get rid of it. And now the minister prayed. A good, generous prayer it was, and went into details. It pleaded for the church, and the little children of the church, for the other churches of the village, for the village itself, for the county, for the state, for the state officers, for the United States, for the churches of the United States, for Congress, for the President, for the officers of the government, for poor sailors tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and Oriental despotisms, for such as have the light and the good tidings, and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal, for the heathen in the far islands of the sea, 
and closed with a supplication that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favor, and be as seeds sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. There was a rustling of dresses, and the standing congregation sat down. The boy whose history this book relates did not enjoy the prayer. He only endured it, if he even did that much. He was restive all through it. He kept tally of the details of the prayer unconsciously, for he was not listening, but he knew the ground of old and the clergyman's regular route over it, and when a little trifle of new matter was interlarded, his ear detected it and his whole nature resented it. He considered additions unfair and scoundrelly. In the midst of the prayer a fly had lit on the back of the pew in front of him, and tortured his spirit by calmly rubbing its hands together, embracing its head with its arms, and polishing it so vigorously that it seemed to almost part company with the body, and the slender thread of a neck was exposed to view. Scraping its wings with its hind legs, and smoothing them to its body as if they had been coat-tails, going through its whole toilet as tranquilly as if it knew it was perfectly safe, as indeed it was for as sorely as Tom's hands itched to grab for it, they did not dare. He believed his soul would be instantly destroyed if he did such a thing while the prayer was going on. But with the closing sentence his hand began to curve and steal forward, and the instant the Amen was out, the fly was a prisoner of war. His aunt detected the act, and made him let it go. The minister gave out his text, and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod, and yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone, and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Tom counted the pages of the sermon. After church he always knew how many pages there had been, but he seldom knew anything else about the discourse. However, this time he was really interested for a little while. The minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's hosts at the millennium, when the lion and the lamb should lie down together and a little child should lead them. But the pathos, the lesson, the moral of the great spectacle were lost upon the boy. He only thought of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations. His face lit with the thought, and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child if it was a tame lion. Now he lapsed into suffering again, as the dry argument was resumed. Presently he bethought him of a treasure he had, and got it out. It was a large black beetle with formidable jaws—a pinch-bug, he called it. It was in a percussion cap-box. The first thing the beetle did was to take him by the finger. A natural Philip followed. The beetle went floundering into the aisle, and lit on its back, and the hurt finger went into the boy's mouth. The beetle lay there, working its helpless legs, unable to turn over. Tom eyed it, and longed for it, but it was safe out of his reach. Other people uninterested in the sermon found relief in the beetle, and they eyed it, too. Presently a vagrant poodle-dog came idling along, sad at heart, lazy with the summer softness and the quiet, weary of captivity, sighing for change. He spied the beetle. The drooping tail lifted and wagged. He surveyed the prize, walked around it smelt at it from a safe distance, walked around it again, grew bolder, and took a closer smell, then lifted his lip and made a gingerly snatch at it, just missing it, made another and another, began to enjoy the diversion, subsided to his stomach with the beetle between his paws, and continued his experiments, grew weary at last, and then indifferent and absent-minded. His head nodded, and little by little his chin descended and touched the enemy who seized it. There was a sharp yelp, a flirt of the poodle's head, and the beetle fell a couple of yards away, and lit on its back once more. The neighboring spectators shook with a gentle inward joy. Several faces went behind fans and handkerchiefs, and Tom was entirely happy. The dog looked foolish, and probably felt so, but there was resentment in his heart, too, and a craving for revenge. So he went to the beetle and began a wary attack on it again, jumping at it from every point of a circle, lighting with his forepaws within an inch of the creature, making even closer snatches at it with his teeth, and jerking his head till his ears flapped again. But he grew tired once more, after a while, tried to amuse himself with a fly, but found no relief, followed an ant around with his nose close to the floor, and quickly wearied of that yawned, sighed, forgot the beetle entirely, and sat down on it. 
Then there was a wild yelp of agony, and the poodle went sailing up the aisle. The yelps continued, and so did the dog. He crossed the house in front of the altar. He flew down the other aisle. He crossed before the doors. He clambered up the home stretch. His anguish grew with his progress, till presently he was but a woolly comet moving in its orbit with a gleam and the speed of light. At last the frantic sufferer sheared from its course and sprang into its master's lap. He flung it out of the window, and the voice of distress quickly thinned away and died in the distance. By this time the whole church was red-faced and suffocating with suppressed laughter, and the sermon had come to a dead standstill. The discourse was resumed presently, but it went lame and halting, all possibility of impressiveness being at an end, for even the gravest sentiments were constantly being received with a smothered burst of unholy mirth, under cover of some remote pew-back, as if the poor parson had said a rarely facetious thing. It was a genuine relief to the whole congregation when the ordeal was over and the benediction pronounced. Tom Sawyer went home quite cheerful thinking to himself that there was some satisfaction about divine service when there was a bit of variety in it. He had but one marring thought. He was willing that the dog should play with his pinch-bug, but he did not think it was upright in him to carry it off. CHAPTER Six, TOM MEETS BECKY Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Monday morning always found him so, because it began another week's slow suffering in school. He generally began that day with wishing he had had no intervening holiday. It made the going into captivity in fetters again so much more odious. Tom lay thinking. Presently it occurred to him that he wished he was sick. Then he could stay home from school. Here was a vague possibility. He canvassed his system. No ailment was found and he investigated again. This time he thought he could detect colicky symptoms, and he began to encourage them with considerable hope. But they soon grew feeble, and presently died wholly away. He reflected further. Suddenly he discovered something. One of his upper front teeth was loose. This was lucky. He was about to begin to groan as a starter, as he called it, when it occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument, his aunt would pull it out, and that would hurt. So he thought he would hold the tooth in reserve for the present, and seek further. Nothing offered for some little time, and then he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks, and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe from under the sheet, and held it up for inspection. But now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, it seemed well worth while to chance it so he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. Tom groaned louder, and fancied that he began to feel pain in the toe. No result from Sid. Tom was panting with his exertions by this time. He took a rest, and then swelled himself up and fetched a succession of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. He said, Sid! Sid! and shook him. This course worked well, and Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched, then brought himself up on his elbow with a snort, and began to stare at Tom. Tom went on groaning, and Sid said, "'Tom! Say, Tom!' No response. "'Here, Tom! Tom! What is the matter, Tom?' And he shook him and looked in his face anxiously. Tom moaned out, "'Oh! Don't, Sid! Don't joggle me! Why, what's the matter, Tom? I, I must call Auntie!' "'No, never mind. It'll be over by and by, maybe. Don't call anybody. But I must. Don't groan so, Tom. It's awful. How long you been this way?' "'Hours. Ouch! Oh, don't stir so, Sid. You'll, you'll kill me.' "'Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't! It makes my flesh crawl to hear you. Tom, what is the matter?' "'I forgive you everything, Sid.' Oh, everything you've ever done to me, when I'm gone. Tom, don't, you, you ain't dying, are you? Don't, Tom, oh, don't. Maybe, oh, I forgive everything, Sid. Oh, tell him so, Sid. And, Sid, you give my window sash and my cat with one eye to that new girl that's come to town, and, and tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. Tom was suffering in reality now, so handsomely was his imagination working, and so his groans had gathered quite a genuine tone. 
Sid flew downstairs and said, "'Oh, Aunt Polly, come! Tom's dying!' "'Dying? Yes'm, don't wait. Come quick. Rubbish! I don't believe it!' But she fled upstairs, nevertheless, with Sid and Mary at her heels, and her face grew white, too, and her lip trembled. When she reached the bedside, she gasped out, "'You, Tom! Tom, what's the matter with you?' "'Oh, Auntie, I'm—' "'What's the matter with you? What is the matter with you, child?' "'Oh, Auntie, my sore toes mortified!' The old lady sank down into the chair and laughed a little, then cried a little, then did both together. This restored her, and she said, "'Tom, what a turn you did give me! Now you shut up that nonsense and climb out of this!' The groan ceased, and the pain vanished from the toe. The boy felt a little foolish, and he said, "'Aunt Polly, it seemed mortified, and it hurt so I never minded my tooth at all.' "'Your tooth, indeed. What's the matter with your tooth?' "'One of them's loose, and it aches perfectly awful.' "'There, there, now. Don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die about that. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen.' Tom said, "'Oh, please, Auntie, don't pull it out. It don't hurt any more. I wish I may never stir if it does. Please don't, Auntie. I don't want to stay home from school.' "'Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go a-fishing.' "'Tom, Tom, I love you so, and you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart with your outrageousness.' By this time the dental instruments were ready. The old lady made one end of the silk thread fast to Tom's tooth with a loop, and tied the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the chunk of fire, and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face. The tooth hung dangling by the bedpost now. But all trials bring their compensations. As Tom wended to school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met, because the gap in his upper row of teeth enabled him to expectorate in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition, and one that had cut his finger and had been a centre of fascination and homage up to this time, now found himself suddenly without an adherent, and shorn of his glory. His heart was heavy, and he said with a disdain which he did not feel that it wasn't anything to spit like Tom Sawyer, but another boy said, Sour grapes, and he wandered away a dismantled hero. Shortly Tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town, because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad and because all their children admired him so, and delighted in his forbidden society, and wished they dared to be like him. Tom was like the rest of the respectable boys, in that he envied Huckleberry his gaudy, outcast condition, and was under strict orders not to play with him. So he played with him every time he got a chance. Huckleberry was always dressed in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men, and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags. His hat was a vast ruin, with a wide crescent lopped out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung nearly to his heels, and had the rearward buttons far down the back. But one suspender supported his trousers. The seat of the trousers bagged low and contained nothing. The fringed legs dragged in the dirt when not rolled up. Huckleberry came and went at his own free will. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather, and in empty hogsheads in wet. He did not have to go to school, or to church, or call any being master, or obey anybody. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose, and stay as long as it suited him. Nobody forbade him to fight. He could sit up as late as he pleased. He was always the first boy that went barefoot in the spring, and the last to resume leather in the fall. He never had to wash, nor put on clean clothes. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, everything that goes to make life precious that boy had so thought every harassed hampered respectable boy in st petersburg tom hailed the romantic outcast hello huckleberry hello yourself and see how you like it what's that you got dead cat let me see him huck my he's pretty stiff where'd you get him bought him off in a boy what'd you give i give a blue ticket and a bladder that i got at the slaughterhouse where'd you get the blue ticket bought it off in Ben Rogers two weeks ago for a hoop-stick. Say, what is dead cats good for, Huck? Good for? Cure warts with. No, is that so? 
I know something that's better. I bet you don't. What is it? Why, spunk water. Spunk water? I wouldn't give a dern for spunk water. You wouldn't, wouldn't you? Do you ever try it? No, I hain't. But Bob Tanner did. Who told you so? Why, he told Jeff Thatcher, and Jeff told Johnny Baker, and Johnny told Jim Hollis, and Jim told Ben Rogers, and Ben told a nigger, and the nigger told me. There now. Well, what of it? They'll all lie, leastwise all but the nigger. I don't know him. But I never see a nigger that wouldn't lie. Shucks! Now you tell me how Bob Tanner done it, Huck. Why, he took and dipped his hand in a rotten stump where the rainwater was. In the daytime? Certainly. With his face to the stump? Yes. Least I reckon so. Did he say anything? I don't reckon he did. I, I don't know. Aha! Talk about trying to cure warts with spunk water such a blame fool way as that. Why, that ain't a going to do any good. You got to go all by yourself to the middle of the woods where you know there's a spunk water stump, and just as it's midnight, you back up against the stump and jam your hand in and say, Barley corn, barley corn, injun meal shorts, spunk water, spunk water, swallow these warts, and then walk away quick, eleven steps, with your eyes shut, and then turn around three times and walk home without speaking to anybody, because if you speak, the charm's busted. Well, that sounds like a good way. But that ain't the way Bob Tanner done. No, sir, you can bet he didn't, because he's the wartiest boy in this town, and he wouldn't have a wart on him if he'd known how to work spunk water. I've took thousands of warts off my hands that way, Huck. I play with frogs so much I've always got considerable many warts. Sometimes I take em off with a bean. Yes, bean's good. I've done that. Have you? What's your way? You take and split the bean and cut the wart so as to get some blood, and then you put the blood on one piece of the bean and take and dig a hole and bury it about midnight at the crossroads in the dark of the moon, and then you burn up the rest of the bean. You see, that piece that's got the blood on it will keep drawing and drawing, trying to fetch the other piece to it, and so that helps the blood to draw the wart, and pretty soon off she comes. Yes, that's it, Huck, that's it, though when you're burying it, if you say, down, bean, off, wart, come no more to bother me, it's better. That's the way Joe Harper does, and he's been nearly to Coonville and most everywheres. But say, how do you cure him with dead cats? Why, you take your cat and go and get in the graveyard long about midnight when somebody that was wicked has been buried, and when it's midnight a devil will come, or maybe two or three, but you can't see em. You can only hear something like the wind, or maybe hear em talk. And when they're taking that feller away, you heave your cat after em and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat, I'm done with ya. And that'll fetch any wart. Sounds right. Do you ever try it, Huck? No, but old Mother Hopkins told me. Well, I reckon it's so, then, because they say she's a witch. Say? Why, Tom, I know she is. She witched Pap. Pap says so his own self. He come along one day, and he see she was a witchin' him, so he took up a rock, and if she hadn't dodged, he'd a got her. Well, that very night he rolled off in the shed where he was a layin' drunk and broke his arm. Why, that's awful. How did he know she was a witchin' him? Lord, Pap can tell easy. Pap says when they keep lookin' at you right stiddy, they're a witchin' you, especially if they mumble. "'Cause when they mumble, they're saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. "'Say, Hucky, when you going to try the cat? "'Tonight. "'I reckon they'll come after old Hoss Williams tonight. "'But they buried him Saturday. "'Didn't they get him Saturday night? "'Why, how you talk! "'How could their charms work till midnight, and then it's Sunday? "'Devils don't slosh round much of a Sunday, I don't reckon. "'I never thought of that. "'That's so. Let me go with you.' Of course, if you ain't afeard. Afeard? Tain't likely. Will you meow? Yes, and you meow back, if you get a chance. Last time you kept me a meowin' around till old Hayes went to throwing rocks at me and says, Darn that cat! And so I hove a brick through his window. But don't you tell. I won't. I couldn't meow that night because Auntie was watching me. But I'll meow this time. Say, what's that? Nothing but a tick. Where'd you get him? Out in the woods. What do you take for him? I don't know. I, I don't want to sell him. All right. It's a mighty small tick, anyway. Oh, anybody can run a tick down that don't belong to them. 
I'm satisfied with it. It's a good enough tick for me. Sho, there's ticks a-plenty. I could have a thousand of them if I wanted to. Well, why don't you? Because you know mighty well you can't. This is a pretty early tick, I reckon. It's the first one I've seen this year. Say, Huck, I'll give you my tooth for him. Let's see it. Tom got out a bit of paper and carefully unrolled it. Huckleberry viewed it wistfully. The temptation was very strong. At last he said, "'Is it genuine?' Tom lifted his lip and showed the vacancy. "'Well, all right,' said Huckleberry. "'It's a trade.' Tom enclosed the tick in the percussion cap box that had lately been the pinch-bug's prison, and the boys separated, each feeling wealthier than before. When Tom reached the little isolated frame schoolhouse, he strode in briskly, with the manner of one who had come with all honest speed. He hung his hat on a peg and flung himself into his seat with business-like alacrity. The master, throned on high in his great splint-bottom armchair, was dozing, lulled by the drowsy hum of study. The interruption roused him. "'Thomas Sawyer!' Tom knew that when his name was pronounced in full it meant trouble. "'Sir, come up here. Now, sir, why are you late again, as usual?' Tom was about to take refuge in a lie when he saw two long tails of yellow hair hanging down a back that he recognized by the electric sympathy of love, and by that form was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. He instantly said, I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. The master's pulse stood still, and he stared helplessly. The buzz of study ceased. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind. The master said, You—you you did what? Stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. There was no mistaking the words. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever listened to. No mere feral will answer for this offence. Take off your jacket. The master's arm performed until it was tired, and the stock of switches notably diminished. Then the order followed. "'Now, sir, go and sit with the girls, and let this be a warning to you.' The titter that rippled around the room appeared to abash the boy, but in reality that result was caused rather more by his worshipful awe of his unknown idol, and the dread pleasure that lay in his high good fortune. He sat down upon the end of the pine bench, and the girl hitched herself away from him with a toss of her head. Nudges and winks and whispers traversed the room, but Tom sat still with his arms upon the long, low desk before him, and seemed to study his book. By and by attention ceased from him, and the accustomed school murmur rose upon the dull air once more. Presently the boy began to steal furtive glances at the girl. She observed it made a mouth at him, and gave him the back of her head for the space of a minute. When she cautiously faced around again, a peach lay before her. She thrust it away. Tom gently put it back. She thrust it away again, but with less animosity. Tom patiently returned it to its place. Then she let it remain. Tom scrawled on his slate, "'Please take it. I got more.' The girl glanced at the words, but made no sign. Now the boy began to draw something on the slate hiding his work with his left hand. For a time the girl refused to notice, but her human curiosity presently began to manifest itself by hardly perceptible signs. The boy worked on, apparently unconscious. The girl made a sort of non-committal attempt to see it, but the boy did not betray that he was aware of it. At last she gave in, and hesitatingly whispered, "'Let me see it.' Tom uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with two gable ends to it, and a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney. Then the girl's interest began to fasten itself upon the work as she forgot everything else. When it was finished she gazed a moment, then whispered, "'It's nice. Make a man.' The artist erected a man in the front yard that resembled a derrick. He could have stepped over the house, but the girl was not hypercritical. She was satisfied with the monster, and whispered, it's a beautiful man. Now make me coming along." Tom drew an hourglass with a full moon and straw limbs to it, and armed the spreading fingers with a portentous fan. The girl said, "'It's ever so nice. I wish I could draw.' "'It's easy,' whispered Tom. I'll learn you.' "'Oh, will you? When?' "'At noon. Do you go home to dinner?' "'I'll stay, if you will.' "'Good. That's a whack. What's your name?' "'Becky Thatcher. What's yours?' Oh, I know. It's Thomas Sawyer. That's the name they lick me by. I'm Tom when I'm good. You can call me Tom, will you?" 
Yes. Now Tom began to scrawl something on the slate, hiding the words from the girl, but she was not backward this time. She begged to see. And Tom said, Oh, it ain't anything. Yes, it is. No, it ain't. You, you don't want to see it. Yes, I do. Indeed I do. Please let me. You'll tell. No, I won't. Deed and deed and double deed I won't. You won't tell anybody at all? Ever as long as you live? No, I won't ever tell anybody. Now let me. Oh, you don't want to see. Now that you treat me so, I will see." And she put her small hand upon his, and a little scuffle ensued, Tom pretending to resist in earnest, but letting his hand slip by degrees, till these words were revealed. I love you. Oh, you bad thing! And she hit his hand a smart rap, but reddened and looked pleased nevertheless. Just at this juncture the boy felt a slow, fateful grip closing on his ear, and a steady lifting impulse. In that vice he was borne across the house, and deposited in his own seat, under a peppering fire of giggles from the whole school. Then the master stood over him during a few awful moments, and finally moved away to his throne without saying a word. But although Tom's ear tingled, his heart was jubilant. As the school quieted down, Tom made an honest effort to study, but the turmoil within him was too great. In turn he took his place in the reading class, and made a botch of it then in the geography class, and turned lakes into mountains, mountains into rivers, and rivers into continents, till chaos was come again, then in the spelling class, and got turned down by a succession of mere baby words, till he brought up at the foot and yielded up the pewter medal which he had worn with ostentation for months. End of chapter 6《The Adventures of Tom Sawyer》by Mark Twain, Chapter Seven, Tick Running, and a Heartbreak. The harder Tom tried to fasten his mind on his book, the more his ideas wandered. So at last, with a sigh and a yawn, he gave it up. It seemed to him that the noon recess would never come. The air was utterly dead. There was not a breath stirring. It was the sleepiest of sleepy days. The drowsing murmur of the five-and-twenty studying scholars soothed the soul like the spell that is in the murmur of bees. Away off in the flaming sunshine, Cardiff Hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat, tinted with the purple of distance. A few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air. No other living thing was visible but some cows, and they were asleep. Tom's heart ached to be free, or else to have something of interest to do to pass the dreary time. His hand wandered into his pocket, and his face lit up with a glow of gratitude that was prayer, though he did not know it. Then, furtively, the percussion cap box came out. He released the tick and put him on the long, flat desk. The creature probably glowed with a gratitude that amounted to prayer, too, at this moment, but it was premature, for when he started thankfully to travel off, Tom turned him aside with a pin, and made him take a new direction. Tom's bosom friend sat next him, suffering just as Tom had been, and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant. This bosom friend was Joe Harper. The two boys were sworn friends all the week, and embattled enemies on Saturdays. Joe took a pin out of his lapel, and began to assist in exercising the prisoner. The sport grew in interest momently. Soon Tom said that they were interfering with each other, and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick. So he put Joe's slate on the desk, and drew a line down the middle of it from top to bottom. Now, said he, as long as he is on your side, you can stir him up, and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get on my side, you're to leave him alone as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right, go ahead. Start him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently, and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest, the other would look on with interest as strong. The two heads bowed together over the slate, and the two souls dead to all things else. At last luck seemed to settle and abide with Joe. The tick tried this, that, and the other course, and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves. But time and again, just as he would have victory in his very grasp, so to speak, and Tom's fingers would be twitching to begin, Joe's pin would deftly head him off and keep possession. 
At last Tom could stand it no longer. The temptation was too strong, so he reached out and lent a hand with his pin. Joe was angry in a moment. Said he, "'Tom, you let him alone.' "'I only just want to stir him up a little, Joe.' "'No, sir, it ain't fair. You just let him alone.' "'Blame it, I ain't going to stir him much. Let him alone, I tell you.' "'Well, I won't. You shall. He's on my side of the line. Look here, Joe Harper, whose is that tick? I don't care whose tick he is. He's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him.' "'Well, I'll just bet I will, though. He's my tick, and I'll do what I blame please with him, or die.' A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders, and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets and the whole school to enjoy it. The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the school a while before, when the master came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, Put on your bonnet and let on you're going home, and when you get to the corner, give the rest of them the slip, and turn down through the lane and come back. I'll go the other way, and come it over them the same way." So the one went off with one group of scholars, and the other with another. In a little while the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with a slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, "'Do you love rats?' "'No, I hate them.' "'Well, I do, too. Live ones. But I mean dead ones, to swing round your head with a string. No, I, I don't care for rats much, anyway. What I like is chewing gum.' "'Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now.' "'Do you? I've got some.' I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me." That was agreeable, so they chewed it turn about, and dangled their legs against the bench in excess of contentment. "'Was you ever at a circus?' said Tom. "'Yes, and my pa's going to take me again some time, if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times, lots of times. Church ain't shucks to a circus. There's things going on at a circus all the time. I'm going to be a clown in a circus when I grow up.' "'Oh, are you? That will be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up." "'Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money, most a dollar a day,' Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky, was you ever engaged?" "'What's that?' "'Why, engaged to be married.' "'No. Would you like to?' "'I reckon so. I don't know. What is it like?' "'Like? Why, it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him, ever, ever, ever and then you kiss, and that's all. Any, anybody can do it." "'Kiss? What do you kiss for?' "'Why, that, you know, is to—well, they always do that.' "'Everybody?' "'Why, yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate?' Y yes "'What was it?' "'I shan't tell you.' "'Shall I tell you?' Y "'Yes, but some other time.' "'No, now. No, not now. Tomorrow. Oh, no, now. Please, Becky, I'll whisper it. I'll, I'll whisper it ever so easy." Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent, and passed his arm about her waist and whispered the tale ever so softly, with his mouth close to her ear. And then he added, "'Now you whisper it to me, just the same.' She resisted for a while, and then said, "'You turn your face away so you can't see, and, and then I will. But you mustn't ever tell anybody, will you, Tom?' Now you won't, will you?" No, indeed, indeed I won't. Now, Becky. He turned his face away, and she bent timidly around till her breath stirred his curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches, with Tom after her, and took refuge in a corner at last, with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her about her neck and pleaded, Now, Becky, it's all done, all over but the kiss. Don't you be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky." And he tugged at her apron and the hands. By and by she gave up and let her hands drop. Her face, all glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. Tom kissed the red lips and said, "'Now it's all done, Becky. And always after this, you know, you ain't ever to love anybody but me. 
and you ain't ever to marry anybody but me. Never, never, and forever, will you? No, I'll never love anybody but you, Tom, and I'll never marry anybody but you, and you ain't to ever marry anybody but me, either. Certainly, of course, that, that's part of it. And always coming to school, or when we're going home, you're to walk with me, when there ain't anybody looking, and you choose me and I choose you at parties, because that's the way you do when you're engaged. It's so nice I never heard of it before. Oh, it's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence—' The big eyes told Tom his blunder, and he stopped confused. "'Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you've ever been engaged to.' The child began to cry, and Tom said, "'Oh, don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her any more.' "'Yes, you do, Tom. You know you do.' Tom tried to put his arm about her neck, but she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall and went on crying. Tom tried again with soothing words in his mouth and was repulsed again. Then his pride was up, and he strode away and went outside. He stood about restless and uneasy for a while, glancing at the door every now and then, hoping she would repent and come to find him. But she did not. Then he began to feel badly and fear that he was in the wrong. It was a hard struggle with him to make new advances now, but he nerved himself to it and entered. She was still standing back there in the corner, sobbing, with her face to the wall. Tom's heart smote him. He went to her and stood a moment, not knowing exactly how to proceed. Then he said hesitatingly, "'Becky, I—I I don't care for anybody but you.' No reply, but sobs. "'Becky,' pleadingly, "'Becky, won't you say something?' More sobs. Tom got out his chiefest jewel a brass knob from the top of an andiron, and passed it around her so that she could see it, and said, "'Please, Becky, won't you take it?' She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the house and over the hills and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door. He was not in sight. She flew around to the play-yard. He was not there. Then she called, "'Tom! Come back, Tom!' She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness. So she sat down to cry again and upbraid herself, and by this time the scholars began to gather again, and she had to hide her griefs and still her broken heart, and take up the cross of a long, dreary, aching afternoon, with none among the strangers about her to exchange sorrows with. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 A Pirate Bold to Be Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars, and then fell into a moody jog. He crossed a small branch two or three times, because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffles pursuit. Half an hour later he was disappearing behind the Douglas mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable away off in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood picked his pathless way to the centre of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was not even a zephyr stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker, and this seemed to render the pervading silence and sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees, and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him that life was but a trouble at best, and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream for ever and ever, with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the grass and the flowers over the grave, and nothing to bother and grieve about ever any more. If he only had a clean Sunday-school record he could be willing to go, and be done with it all. Now as to this girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world, and been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry some day, maybe when it was too late. Ah, if he could only die temporarily! But the elastic heart of youth cannot be compressed into one constrained shape long at any time. Tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of this life again. What if he turned his back now, and disappeared mysteriously? What if he went away, 
ever so far away, into unknown countries beyond the seas, and never came back any more. How would she feel then? The idea of being a clown recurred to him now, only to fill him with disgust for frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offence when they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague, august realm of the romantic. No, he would be a soldier, and return after long years all war-worn and illustrious. No, better still, he would join the Indians, and hunt buffaloes and go on the warpath in the mountain ranges and the trackless great plains of the far west, and away in the future come back a great chief bristling with feathers, hideous with paint, and prance into Sunday school, some drowsy summer morning, with a blood-curling war-whoop, and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy. But, no, there was something gaudier even than this. He would be a pirate. That was it. Now his future lay plain before him, and glowing with unimaginable splendor how his name would fill the world, and make people shudder! How gloriously he would go ploughing the dancing seas in his long, low, black-hulled racer, the spirit of the storm, with his grisly flag flying at the fore! And at the zenith of his fame, how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church, brown and weather-beaten, in his black velvet doublet and trunks, his great jack-boots, his crimson sash, his belt bristling with horse-pistols, his crime-rusted cutlass at his side, his slouch-hat with waving plumes, his black flag unfurled, with a skull and crossbones on it, and here, with swelling ecstasy, the whisperings. It's Tom Sawyer, the pirate, the black avenger of the Spanish main. Yes, it was settled. His career was determined. He would run away from home and enter upon it. He would start the very next morning. Therefore he must now begin to get ready. He would collect his resources together. He went to a rotten log near at hand, and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow-knife. He soon struck wood that sounded hollow. He put his hand there, and uttered this incantation impressively. What hasn't come here, come. What's here, stay here. Then he scraped away the dirt, and exposed a pine-shingle. He took it up, and disclosed a shapely little treasure-house, whose bottom and sides were of shingles. In it lay a marble. Tom's astonishment was boundless. He scratched his head with perplexed air, and said, "'Well, that beats anything!' Then he tossed the marble away pettishly, and stood cogitating. The truth was that a superstition of his had failed, here, which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible. If you buried a marble with certain necessary incantations, and left it alone a fortnight, and then opened the place with the incantation he had just used, you would find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves together there, meantime, no matter how widely they had been separated. But now this thing had actually and unquestionably failed. Tom's whole structure of faith was shaken to its foundations. He had many a time heard of this thing succeeding, but never of its failing before. It did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before, himself, but could never find the hiding-places afterward. He puzzled over the matter some time, and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm. He thought he would satisfy himself on that point, so he searched around till he found a small sandy spot with a little funnel-shaped depression in it. He laid himself down, and put his mouth close to this depression, and called, "'Doodlebug, doodlebug, tell me what I want to know! Doodlebug, doodlebug, tell me what I want to know!' The sand began to work, and presently a small black bug appeared for a second, and then darted under again, in a fright. "'He doesn't tell. So it was a witch that done it. I just knowed it!" He well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches, so he gave up discouraged. But it occurred to him that he might as well have the marble he had just thrown away, and therefore he went and made a patient search for it. But he could not find it. Now he went back to his treasure-house, and carefully placed himself just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away. Then he took another marble from his pocket, and tossed it in the same way, saying, "'Brother, go find your brother!' He watched where it stopped, and went there and looked. But it must have fallen short or gone too far, so he tried twice more. The last repetition was successful. The two marbles lay within a foot of each other. 
Just here the blast of a toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest. Tom flung off his jacket and trousers, turned a suspender into a belt, raked away some brush behind the rotten log, disclosing a rude bow and arrow, a lath sword, and a tin trumpet, and in a moment had seized these things and bounded away bare-legged with fluttering shirt. He presently halted under a great elm, blew an answering blast, and then began to tiptoe and look warily out, this way and that. He said cautiously to an imaginary company, "'Hold, my merry men! Keep hid till I blow!' Now appeared Joe Harper, as airily clad and elaborately armed as Tom. Tom called, "'Hold! Who comes into Sherwood Forest without my pass?' "'Guy of Giesborne wants no man's pass. Who art thou that—that—' that "'Dares to hold such language,' said Tom, prompting, for they talked by the book from memory. "'Who art thou that dares to hold such language? I, indeed, I am Robin Hood, as thy caitiff carcass soon shall know. Then art thou indeed that famous outlaw? Right gladly will I dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood. Have at thee!' They took their lath swords, dumped their other traps on the ground, and struck a fencing attitude, foot to foot, and began a grave, careful combat, two up and two down. Presently Tom said, "'Now, if you've got the hang, go it lively!' So they went it lively, panting and perspiring with the work. By and by Tom shouted, "'Fall! Fall! Why don't you fall?' "'I shan't! Why don't you fall yourself? You're getting the worst of it.' "'Why, that ain't anything. I can't fall. That ain't the way it is in the book.' The book says, then with one black-handed stroke he slew poor Guy of Giesborne. You're to turn round and let me hit you on the back. There was no getting around the authorities, so Joe turned, received the whack, and fell. Now, said Joe, getting up, you got to let me kill you. That's fair. Why, I can't do that. It ain't in the book. Well, it's blamed mean, that's all. Well, say, Joe, you can be Friar Tuck or, or Much, the miller's son, and lamb me with a quarter-staff. Or I'll be the sheriff of Nottingham, and you be Robin Hood a little while, and kill me." This was satisfactory, and so these adventures were carried out. Then Tom became Robin Hood again, and was allowed by the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away through his neglected wound. And at last Joe, representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws, dragged him sadly forth, gave his bow into his feeble hands, and Tom said, "'Where this arrow falls! There bury poor Robin Hood under the greenwood tree. Then he shot the arrow and fell back, and would have died, but he lit on a nettle, and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws any more, and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. End of chapter 8